Thank you, Angela. Ani Buju, Adam Sprite Nadijnakaz, Gawaba Baganikog in Donjiba, Kiksadi in Doden. What I just said is hello. My name is Adam Spry. I come from the White Earth Anishinaabe Nation in Minnesota, and I am claimed by my Kiksadi relatives. Before we begin, I would like to recognize that we are gathered, at least virtually, on the homelands of the Nipmuc, Wampanoag, and Massachusetts peoples. I also acknowledge that our presence here is predicated on a history of violence, colonization, and dispossession that continues to this day. Finally, I want to acknowledge that recognition is not enough. Every day we should actively seek justice for the customary stewards of this place and all indigenous peoples around the world. I'm here tonight to introduce the third event this year in Emerson College's reading series, sponsored by the Department of Writing, Literature and Publishing, where I am an assistant professor of indigenous literatures. Tonight's guest is the prolific Chickasaw novelist, poet and essayist, Linda Hogan. As a scholar of Native American literature and as a Native person myself, I cannot overstate the value of Linda's work in capturing the difficulty and pain, but also the great beauty of Native life. In novels such as Solar Storms, People of the Whale, and Mean Spirit, Hogan skillfully weaves Native history and cultures together with a strong commitment to activism, consistently advocating for the shared rights of the land and the people who belong to it. In her evocative lyric poems, many of which appear in the recent collections Dark Sweet and A History of Kindness, uh, explore the same themes at a more intimate scale, illustrating in clear, incisive verse the profound relationships that can be forged with the earth and its inhabitants. Finally, as an essayist and memoirist, Linda Hogan often meditates on connection itself between environmental and feminist activism historical trauma and personal healing, and most consistently, that between humans and the people we sometimes call animals. As she writes in her latest collection of essays, The Radiant Lives of Animals, Hogan reminds us that, quote, human beings are not the center of the environment, end quote. Rather, she says, it is the living world that, quote, creates our humanity and is what inhabits us. That message is at the, uh, the core of all of Linda Hogan's work, but especially in a novel that is particularly important to me. I first read Linda Hogan's Power shortly after moving to South Florida several years ago. In that novel, Omishto, a young Native woman living in the Everglades, learns that protecting one's homeland sometimes demands great acts of personal sacrifice. Finding myself somewhat unmoored in a landscape completely unlike those I had known before, Power taught me to see Florida through Omishto's eyes as a place of deep history, profound me meaning, and worthy of fierce, protective love. I will always think of the glades as Hogan describes them so perfectly as the place where clouds are born. In addition to her writing, Linda Hogan has advocated on behalf of indigenous peoples in the environment as a teacher, collaborator, and activist. She is Professor Emerita at the University of Colorado and was on the creative writing faculty at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She has also worked with scientists in tracking the migration of gray whales and the health of Florida panthers and has spoken on indigenous and environmental issues internationally. For her work, Hogan has received numerous awards and accolades, indeed far more than I can hope to list here. Among these, however, is the 2016 Thoreau Prize from Penn a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native, Writer, Native Writers Circles of the Americas, multiple Colorado Book Awards, and her novel Mean Spirit was a final, finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. Perhaps most importantly, at least to me, in 2007, she was honored by her people by being inducted into the Chickasaw Nation Hall of Fame. Please help me to honor her once again by welcoming Linda Hogan. Thank you. Tonight I'm going to um, read some poetry and some of it is from the Book of Kindness, most of it. And then I will also um, read an essay. I hope that I have time to do all that. We'll see how it goes. Thank you very much, Adam, for the introduction. Thank you, Christine, for the invitation and 
Angie and everybody who's worked on this. I appreciate all of your efforts. And I'm, it's interesting to know your locations and where you are. And I'm, my cousin is Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq. I can't say it anymore. <laughs> the pronunciations change over time. And so um, she's a Batiste there. And uh, there are a lot of people that live in that area and have lived in that area. And mostly now I think of where I'm living and who has lived here. And this was, as you will read in the Radiant, uh, the Radiant Lives of Animals, was a meeting place and across, just on the other side of the mountain, you can't see over here, um, are the Red Rocks, which was a place of peace for everyone. Uh, that came through here. And so there were numerous tribes that came through and remained there. And uh, several miles away is a hot springs, also a place of peace. Um, there are places, I was thinking about salt today that we protected a location of salt um, and anyone could come there to get salt from any nation whether they were against us or not. I'm gonna start with a poem called Eagle Feather Prayer. I think, thank the eagle and old mother for this prayer. I send to earth and sky and to sacred waters. I thank old mother and the golden eagle they are the ones who taught me to pray with no words. They taught the part of me that is unnamed by anatomy books. And so I stand here facing you and the rest of creation also with secret names. I send this prayer thanking those who risk their lives for clean, sweet water. And once again, there is the great silence of what happened to the buffalo. And so hard it is to pray for the shooters who laughed about hitting the girl with one good shot. We love our horses. We love the dogs that helped us. We love the wilderness of buffalo herds. We are humans who love, but I don't know who they are the shooters, or their purpose for being. With no words, just part of my named self, I hold this fan from old mother and the eagle. With all my strength, I send this prayer, so very silent. Maybe I'll say something about the eagle, the golden eagle. I called her my grandmother. I worked with Birds of Prey Rehabilitation Facility in Broomfield, Colorado. And um, she was the one eagle that could not fly through the flight cages that were very large and um, go up onto the perches. So she had a tree trunk that was cut off and that's what she sat on. And so when I would clean up underneath her, clean the pellets and everything else that was down there, animal bones, um, she would always put a wing out over me as if keeping me close. And occasionally would broom my nasty looking hair because it wasn't sleek enough for the flight. So, <laughs> uh, you know, to have your... Uh, your little ones fly, you have to have them groomed perfectly. So I called her grandmother and when she left to go to an educational facility, it broke my heart. And that was the start of that poem. I won't tell you about all the others, I'll just read. When the body wishes to speak, she will reach into the night and pull back the rapture of this growing root 
which has no faith in the other planets of the universe, but her feet have walked in the same bones of the ancestors over long trails, leaving behind the oldest forest. They walk on the ghosts of all that has gone before them, not just plant, but animal, human, the bones of the ones who left their horses to drink with them at the spring, running through Earth's mortal body, which has much to tell about what happened that day. When the body wishes to speak, from the hands, it tells how it pulled children back from death, and it remembers every detail, washing the children's bodies, legs, bellies. The future of my people brought out of the river in a spring freeze. That is the only part of the story of hands that touched our future. This all started so simply, with just a body so much to say, one with the hum of her own life in a quiet room, one of the root growing, finding a way through stone, one not remembering nights with men and guns, the ragged clothes and broken bones of a body. Let's go back to the hands, the thumb that makes us human. But don't other creatures use tools and lift what they need, intelligent all, like the crows here, one making a cast of earth clay for the broken wing of the other, remaining until it healed then breaking the clay to fly away together. I would do that too, since a human can make no claims better than other, any other, especially without wings, only hands that don't know these intelligent lessons. Still, I think of the willows made into a fence and even cut they began to root, root and leaf, then tore off the wires as they grew. A human does off, throw off the bonds if she can, if she tries, if it's possible. The body is so finely a miracle of its own, created of the elements of anything that lived on earth, where everything that was, still is. The red part. When I was a girl, the old women told me if I were always generous, I could paint a heart in the middle of my hair with red red ochre, red paint, red lipstick, some even used. But it seemed not right to reveal to the world that I was generous, as if the announcement takes it back. So unlike other girls, I appeared selfish, even if I gave so much, and who would know I gave my buckskin dress, my leggings and moccasins beaded so well, even the silver bands for my hair. I think of the many red parts, even the parting of the sea by Moses leading his people in a never ending story, or the parting in the red stem of the plant for healing bad lungs, the splitting of the heart when one side works against the other and the veins in their miles flow back again and again. But the red part I recall the most had to do with generosity, 
and then are giving up the taken land and forest to those who wanted it so. We parted with our clothing, our families, and on our way, we left the red farewell of a blood trail along the land we walked. It looked like writing that became the book coming after us with words of truth. If home is the body, if, as they say, your home resembles your body, please pardon my rumpled clothing, this untidy appearance. But in this home are pockets of memory, stones I carried from places of holiness, beside the disordered papers, so plentiful and unfinished. The windows need no curtains, only light peers in, as does the moon from the black vessel of night rising over red mountains. And I think how the Nautilus rises, shining on the surface of every darkness. We are the bones who came from the ones who survived buried in that place after walking the death trail from Mississippi, Misa Sipokna. We walked into this lost foreign place, having no homes, no body of peace, just the papers with signatures of those who made promises not held. Now our bones are revealed like truths, We've taken up from two, two from once invisible lines with lost names, lost horses, our lost relations who would have loved us from some other place they do. And I think what they feel in that force of water we lived and traveled by, it was our life. So I say to our bones, yes, go. I don't know if anybody noticed a little skip in that that changed topics because um, a page is missing from my manuscript. <laughs> so um, I was going to, uh, figure out what happened here, if you'll give me a moment. I had them all in order and now they're not. So I will keep going as if nothing happened. And when I come to that poem, I'll read it again. Outside my cabin. The day the buffalo appeared where I live with wild horses, I thought, they are clearing the land again for ranches after the old growth, as they did clear us away, then the wild horses and even the wolves. Recently, a pack of wolves came down from the Yellowstone fire, five ghostly presences floating across the snow. No one believed me at first, and that was good, because no shooters saw them here. It was as if they were transparent, but the ghostly animals killed a deer outside my window. I followed the blood, a thinning trail to the pink chewed bones, only teeth marks still on them. Later, I returned from work to find they'd attacked an elk. When I stepped forward, they disappeared so quickly into the wind-blown snow, but the still living elk remained close with the horses until it healed. I was its protector, then it was gone. I tell no one about the buffalo living here now because I know what they would do. 
You ask why they would do it? I think it is in their blood to leave a forest of cleared trees, a wake of red, as if they can or can't help themselves. God of the Prairies. What name is the God of the Prairies? In this place so large and humble, so filled with medicines, and even the tunneling creatures of earth being the ones who call down rain. Beneath this richness are rivers, a lake underneath. Children, that water was what I wished for you, more water than what remains. Here, where no one of us is superior to the minions of butterflies, insects, coming to the plants, the wealth of wings, and at the golden march, the flash of red. I was born to this, singing or telling a story to tall grasses, the horses alive and listening as they are, an evening hearing the past dark thunder of bison running down the distance biting back their hooves. The land is honest, at least, and the other creatures never lie. All those many gods of the prairie here in this place and the stand of trees down near the river, trees not yet cut, so there's no drought there, not yet. I wanted to not talk, but I need to talk about the prairie dogs because, well, first I learned about their language from some researchers a long time ago. And then after that, National Geographic had an article about the prairie dogs and how intelligent they were and how they um, do describe people. They set up microphones and had them describing people that walked by. So they'd say, that one is tall and thin, or that one is more round. And so then one of the old Navajo people told me that they also call down the rain, which makes total sense when you think that they have the tunnels with the water in them attracting water because water attracts water, like in the rainforest, when the trees with their moisture attract more water. So that was the beginning with the God of the prairies and the tunneling creatures. And I just needed to say that because everything is so intelligent and we just think, oh, they're just prairie dogs. Or in some places around here, they have prairie dog shoots. And also the buffalo uh, herd is just four miles from here, um, that way, <laughs> that way. It's like you're here in my bed, in my living room. And, um, and just off the road going the other way is Buffalo Bill's grave. And I always wonder what the buffalo are thinking when they know that Buffalo Bill's grave is so close to them that they must be uh, horrified. One creation. I am a warrior wanting this world to survive, never forgotten. This earth which gave birth to the bison, the scissor tail, the vultures of Tibet, consuming the finally released mystics, the old ones who taught we are always a breath away from bullets. I am from a line of songs, a particle of history told by the wrong people, a country before lines of division. In every gully lies the power of a forest waiting, 
It heard the stories the elders told when they crossed this canyon where I live. I dreamed they passed down to the creek bed, each human creation still present, also loving the same stones I love, the mosses between them, the remembered creek that runs all year. It is hard for some to know the world is a living being. Some live with forgotten truth. Others retreat, replace truth with belief. That's why the books of the Maya were burned like the ones of Australia and the close North. We can weep over such things as lost love as the passing away of others, but also remember those birds, the bison, the grief they have felt, and how the land hurts in more chambers than one small heart could ever hold. A history of kindness. When a child becomes an animal in clouds, changing forms to other creatures, our grief has become a kindness to the sky. When the hay is baled and you worry, what if a mouse or a snake was inside, that is a gentleness. When the horses are fed and all that's left is a withered apple for a woman to eat, and she is grateful for the life of all things, so she feeds it to the horse, that is a good heart. When you are gentle to the skin of others, touching them softly, speaking with gentle words, it is compassion. When there is agreement among those who might have argued instead, it is a gift to all. When skin is the first organ to form in the body of a woman, and skin is the largest organ we have, that is a mother's first protection. If you still love the invisible place where that child once stood, the heart recalling her soft hair, her long dark legs, that is the spaciousness of memory. And when you pick up the old woman on the worn road to help her home, and you see that inside she has nothing you give her the food you have. You give the only can of coffee, then start her wood stove and leave your coat behind on purpose. What else would a real human do? I saw them dancing. They were not two males in a territorial battle, but does lifting their legs and small hooves before bowing to one another in respect, ending their dance, then curling back down near each other around their young in the long spring grasses. I remember the bend in the road where I carried my woven basket of branches and saw the two does dance. It was the season of trees blooming after a rain. And in a ray of light, the last of day were other inhabitants. They carry only their beauty to shine this land. It was the season when blue dragonflies weave above all the other creatures. The spiders drop down on elegant strands 
they say are stronger than we can create. Each life says to the other, yes, you are an animal. You are a song. You are a runner, a flyer. You are so alive. We are all created together with this herd of twilight dancers, more than one. Then they went into the tangle of thickness, thickets. This woman can never follow. I have never had a chance to read this poem. And I've wanted to, so I am going to now. <laughs> the Night in Turkey. I forget many things, but I will never forget the dancers that night in the stone church out far in the country. It was dark. The milk in the cold sky was strongly drawn. Inside we sat with tea and the men came out, nodded at one another. They were just men in white robes and it seems music began, but I can barely remember because the men began encircling themselves at the very core of life and whirling. They stepped in together their robes opening out like tender flowers in first spring. It seemed even the sky unfurled in all its starlit splendor, one white moon in the darkness after another, and the world began to warm again, the stones of the church, the human all had vanished as we were entranced, and something inside us, all this human was silenced and dancers opened something greater in the darkness. And we were there with them. We were one of them. We were in a world that bloomed one winter night from inside the dark building of stones that fell away from us. I'd seen pictures of Sufi dancers, but I'd never seen the real dancers. And it was amaz an amazing experience. Last night, the camel down on its knobby long legs nearby, so surprisingly gentle, laid itself on earth, dust rising up, sand in his hair, all its awkward grace. Not the most loved creature of them all, but there it was, smelling of plants I can't name. And then it laid its head so gently on my leg, so warm it was, such a sudden act of kindness. Um, this is the es an essay that I'd like to read, and um, it's called The Ways of the Cranes. I was fortunate enough to be invited to go to um, Nebraska, to the braided stream where all the cranes from all over the world go to meet one another, to um, perhaps meet their mates or to mate. Um, and they're very noisy. They sound like aliens landing from out in space. And um, they were noisy all night and we finally got used to the noise. I was staying in a room with uh, the writer, the Navajo poet, Laura Tohi. And we were finally able to sleep in the noisy nights. And then one night lightning and thunder struck and they were silent and we couldn't sleep. So for two nights it was quiet and there was no sleeping because of the silence. So we were glad when they started uh, being noisy again. <laughs> the ways of the cranes. 
When the red sun sinks behind the mist in the evening, the sandhill cranes begin to arrive. Long-legged, wings open wide, they come first sparely, two watchers, then in scatterings, and finally in great numbers, lines of them cross the sky to land before us hidden humans. The great birds fly across the mist, through it, necks lengthened, legs stretched out behind them, then landing, their sound an uproar. It has been noted through history that they look like writing across the sky, that they fly like words and sentences. I know a message is given above us one of mystery and animal dignity. They have their inner maps, the memory of constellations and a magnetic pole to place that must feel something like a passion. It is a deep pilgrimage home. As sun passes, water is blue vein and the world currents of heartbeat of this river are even felt by the human in this flat land of golden grasses. They land and congregate one with another until they become the world. Soon no water is seen. More fly directly over us and with such beauty there is not even a word to describe it. They have been to many places and when they leave, they will fly to other worlds, waters we do not know. So many with the last light of evening flashing on their hundred thousand wings that speak the language of feather light, air filled bones. They are driven by what is hidden to most of us, understood in Aboriginal remembrance of traveling the causeways of land and water shine, as we recall the golden, as we recall the eroded passages of time where we too have come together for this sojourn, journeyed seeking survival for all time. They come to this place now, a soft gray field of birds, almost a cloud, except that they stand crowded in the water and talk, noisy, loud, and yet I find it comforting. It is night where all this, let, all this life takes place when they return to the narrowing grade of waters that was once a great crashing river, now sandbars, only a few inches deep. Above, as they continue to arrive, the wind shows the clouds moving with the curve of earth, and the birds look darker than they are in the turning night, all looking like water. They appear as they have done forever along the river, half a million in number, and continue to land for many nights, the voice of earth history crying out, calling, even slightly roaring as humans try to sleep. Tree branches are still without leaves, and yet the pulse of the ground sends the fluid skyward, all attention there. It is the first evening of spring in all its chaos. Sprouts rise from the ground. A volcano erupts in Alaska. The whole earth is filled with motion and life. The birds are this American sky. They are the sand and water, all the elements, even fire in their desire to travel the river braided together in a strand. Tribes have told stories about them, told stories to them for centuries, 
and they have told the tribes the stories of their own entwined journeys. More than the mind or imagination, or even than the spirit can hold, they fly in, black strings of movement across the sky, the night sky, still coming when we leave to walk toward them in darkness, walking bent, single file, trying to be crane, the life that was here before humans. About five years ago, being a rock hound, I found an old bone of an ancient sea turtle near here. Ossified, I was searching for a round river stone to take home with me. I hope to collect, I always hope to collect even a small one from every place I visit. But instead, I found a bit of the ancient world that lived here, along with the ancestors of these cranes. Those great turtles are now gone from the nearby inland waters but the cranes still arrive. They have flown over fences, international boundary lines from Mexico, overcut golden stalks, wetlands, and the each night becomes one special. These sandhills were once a savanna, a world of tall plants and grasslands changed now by farmlands and highways. Once there was a roaring river. It was called by some of the tribes, a place of healing waters. Cranes have a fossil map four and a half million years old. Other research says nine million years. The bones of sandhill cranes have been used by ancient peoples in beads and medicine bundles. Also, the crane leads a line of animals connected with humans in a pictograph that was once thought of as a story, then used in an old Anishinaabe land claim in court, and it held up as legal. Writer Allison Hedgecoke says that in court, says that the Chippewa call the cranes keepers of language, not unlike their writing in the sky or even the tracks in sandy mud. I can understand this of these birds with long black legs, the red top of head and eye, the softly colored feathers and bend of neck. They are animals of dignity, meaning, and a history we only try to imagine, even as we recognize them on ancient pottery designs. They have to do in the human being with divinity. Still, we are always tracking, keeping numbers, measuring that which is without measure, trying to either categorize or to make sense even of meaning or beauty in this world. In our new times, we track most often to help the survival of other lives. And yet the world around us is changing, growing smaller moment by moment. We must encircle that with our knowledge, our intuition, with what we have, what we do not yet have, the learning of an entirety, a wholeness, or an expanded vision that takes in not just the study of one, but the knowledge and understanding of an all. We might track ourselves, our true histories, even truth, constantly forgotten, ignored, and denied. We are not at peace, even among ourselves. What can we say of the rest of the human world, but that it breaks my heart day after day, 
and I wish to fly away with the cranes and be one of them. In the gleaning field by day, legs down when I come to the water, flying by night, going far. Many tribes have watched these elegant birds, many tribes, even those in the north, and for many years. In Mississippi, Tennessee, where we are from, the cranes have gathered in the deep green of water, the blue of it, the sand of it, and there they remain, never leaving, as if they are the ones who hid and remained. Never, they, while the rest of us, my people, were forced to leave our country and walk to Indian territory. These birds of Nebraska's Platte River come through that territory as well, to the red lands and thick trees, to the shallow rivers. Red people, red land, it means. Oklahoma, those are two words, Oklahoma. Red waters, red people. I have seen them, the red fathers, feathers across or above the eye. We sometimes used to design with red paint as we danced. In their Congress of wing and beak and claw, gathering all in one place, crowded, they are a tribe surrounded by stalks and grasses in the wind, winding through a bend in the sky, clouds of the cranes, wings closing and opening, their voices telling us what we need to hear, that we are never going to know what they do, that we are never going to reach the mystery we seek, that we are always going to be children here until we find new ways of knowing and belonging. I don't know how we're doing for time. Um, we have uh, until 815, but if you'd like to read something else or take questions, it's, it's up to you. Um, let me read one, two more poems and take questions. I think this one's important, especially since so many people only recently heard of June 19th. Tulsa. Not the white man riots of the past, but only yesterday, a man was shot in the back by a police officer. She was white, he black, she a medic who didn't help him. Nor did the others who arrived. For minutes they watched while they could have saved him, but for his skin. I try to imagine watching a man die because they fear or hate the darkness of a human, a man who had no weapon, not even words, the man who began his day like any other, saying to his wife, Helene, I'll be back early today. I'm taking you out for Mother's Day. She sat under the lamp with her tea finishing the hymn of their daughter's jeans before she left for work. The pictures on the table of their children, children with more and less melanin in their skin, they are beautiful and smart, loved, and doesn't it scare a father that they are learning to drive? Does it scare you that one dates a white boy and they might love? What does the officer think as she stands watching the man lose blood and die? That she might get in trouble? That she won't? I am a dark woman, part two. Dark, darker, even darker. A Chickasaw woman from the very old days. But if the police saw me today, they would think me white, 
may be whiter than them. I can pass. They would save me, not knowing the history in my skin that lies to them and how I might be thinking of them with fear or something worse. Three, soccer. The kids from the tribe had a chance to go to a soccer game, so they kept up their grades. The game was their reward. Excited, they rode the bus, so quiet and sat on the bleachers, learning the game, quietly watching, until the white men above them poured beer on the children's color of skin poured beer on their coats from the run unknown reservation world from which they came. White men, native children. I wonder if like the policewoman, their soul came from some other place. The current veins of history are open as worlds and borders redefine themselves. We wish for some new seed of vision so the world may grow if only for a moment, silent, wordless and fresh as a bare room with windows open. Friend, even you, I may never know. None of us alike. We are all in the same rushing current of life, each with our one-celled beginning, primordial life opening to step out toward these years of living with stories of those who birthed us. We hope flowing with love, even with childhoods of hurt from being human. And for a time, it all seems fine. In this moment of stopping in the room safe with curtains billowing, for just this moment, can't we touch one another and ask about our lives? Even if the earth knows these veins that run like rivers of sweet water into countries, great one day and gone the next, are flowing into one another to create something new. As we are silent in this moment, to be a friend, no weapon, not even arrows of words, just easy human waters together. Be like the animal that opens hardness and carries inside a pearl or a goddess that steps out to a new human accord. Okay, thank you. Um, why don't we have everybody just, before we go to the Q&A, unmute and, and, and give a round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful, Linda. Um, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, and I'll just say briefly, I, I have to say that the essay about the, the cranes is, is just amazing. Uh, my, my ancestors were crane clan and- um, That's great. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you know the, pic the pictograph I'm talking about, which saved your land. Yeah, yeah, uh, they, yep, All yeah. That line connecting the people, the cranes, the bear, everything. You had the Ajijak, the, the Odudamanan, uh, Odudamanag, the, the, the clan pictures, it. yeah. I always wished I could use it on the cover of a book. It's, it's yeah, it's an amazing thing. I actually show it to my students, but we're getting far afield. Anyway, um, well, uh, we have some questions from the audience that I'm going to, to relay to you um, and uh, have some time uh, to answer. So the first, um, comes from a, a student named Claire uh, Barliant, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, who asks, how do you feel about using animals metaphorically? 
I heard an interview with Ada Limon who said that she resists writing about birds metaphorically. And um, so she's wondering uh, about your point of view about using animals as metaphors. They're not metaphors, they're real. I don't use them as metaphors. I use the real truth of the animals. Everything is not a metaphor. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I'm not an academic. I don't think about metaphors at all. I don't think about form. I just write, and I write what I know is true. And um, I've never used an animal as a metaphor. I just tell the truth about the animals where I live. In fact, I wanted to add to this crane story that. In 2013, we had a terrible flood here and the creek that goes by here turned into a 10 foot river. And after the flood, the river was a braided stream for a while. And the migrating um, cranes landed here. And one night I woke up hearing these most bizarre sounds and I thought, oh, the aliens have finally landed. Thank goodness they're coming to help us. <laughs> figure out how to live in this world. And so um, anyway, then I recognized their voices and I realized that the cranes thought it was a braided stream and they landed there on their migration to New Mexico. They go to Fosca del Pache, so from uh, Nebraska twice a year. They also go to Argentina and Siberia, they go everywhere. So why in the world would you think that I would use an animal as a metaphor? Claire? <laughs> All right, um, next question. Um, I'm so curious about that because <laughs> it's, um, it's a weird question. If you're writing about where you live, you see, I, when I first started writing, I never had a writing class. I was very uh, uneducated all my life. And um, I had to educate myself to keep up with my career. But um, I wrote about the turtles where I lived. Some of them had moss on their backs and the animals where I lived in Oklahoma at the time and how I caught a turtle, a giant water turtle in the, uh, fish pond and it scared me to death because water turtles, they're scary looking, you know, they're snapping turtles. They, they used to say that they could bite you and never let go. So I ran into the house and my grandpa came out and he just like reached over and unhooked it and I was fishing. And, uh, you know, we had snakes, we had tarantulas, we had everything. They weren't metaphors. They were just really there. But for a city person to write about them, it might be a metaphor. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from uh, an alum uh, named Piero Filthy, former student of mine, who asks, from, a, from reading your poetry, I gain a sense through both tone and your imagery that there is a negotiation between the real world and the mystical. As a reader, I am both suspended and present through many of your poems. How do you keep a poem balanced between both of these worlds and not to, and so, so not to make a poem lopsided? The, um, the first essay in The Radiant Lives of Animals talks about where does our soul live? When we talk about human beings having a soul, where does it live? Where do you really live? Do you live in your mind? Do you live in your heart? Do you live in your feet? You live in your whole world and part of it you live in the spiritual world, you live in the physical world, you live in the material world. 
We inhabit all of it with our spirit. Our soul is everything around us. Therefore, it is a balance. And I find if I get in my mind, I keep, I lose that balance. So Dostoevsky, I think it was, had a sign above his desk that said, don't think so that he could write. And um, definitely the soul doesn't live in the mind. The mind, as physicist David Bohm said, is entrained by what you've been told and what you've learned in school. And that's not necessarily, none of it is necessarily true or real. Does that answer your question a little bit? I, 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 I wish I could say, but. <laughs> um, so the next question, and this is the last question that I have, um, actually comes from, uh, 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 Professor Julie Glass, and um, with a with a warning that this is this is going to be a hard question. Um, oh no, they're all hard. <laughs> <laughs> As a writer, what have been your greatest doubts and challenges? How do you meet them? Well, I spent fifteen years, even though I was writing other things like poetry and essays and things. I don't write just one thing at a time. I spent 15 years writing a novel that totally failed. That was my biggest challenge. And someday I will go back to it, start in the middle and start over because I really know where the heartbeat of it is. So that's been my biggest challenge, one of them. The other one is having time. Um, the other one is getting out of my mind and being able to uh, feel my way through a poem, even if I only have one good line in it, or through a novel, understanding what a story is, because that's hard for me to understand what a story really is. I mean, I can tell you examples of things that I know are stories, but I would never be able to write them. And, uh, things that happen here in our little rural area, you know, like someone hunting, uh, killing a deer on, on the land of a friend and not asking permission, and they would have given him permission. So they couldn't, they couldn't understand why he would do that. But it's a much longer story than that because I was involved since I drove by several times since I had left my purse in the road. Fortunately, it's a rural area, so it was still there after I went all the way out to the airport and came back and had to get another flight because I got in a parking lot. And this is way beyond your question, but I'll quit <laughs> while I'm ahead <laughs> before you think I'm really uh, far too far out of it. But um, that's the challenges have been earning a living, being a writer, trying to. Um, it's not easy and the older you get, the harder it gets. Because if you look in poets and writers or you look in any of the magazines, they love the young, beautiful poets, male, beautiful or female, beautiful. They don't like um, people who just look like regular people or people who get older. And so there's that. And I don't want to publicize myself. Um, so I just hope my work will do that for me. I don't want to spend my life on Facebook. I don't want to, I've never been on Instagram. I don't get put, I don't understand Twitter or the purpose of it. So um, once in a while, I'll go on Facebook just to see my family if they're on it. And that's, that's about it. The rest of the time, I just would like to write. The biggest challenge is doing my laundry, cleaning things, and so on. Thank you for that. That's it. Thank you, Linda. That's a great, great answer. Um, 
so actually one more question came in if that's okay with you that's um, fine yeah uh, I really like the questions <laughs> yeah uh, Christine Kassan uh, asks can you speak to the influence of reading on your own work and to the work of any writer on speak to the influence of reading the work of any writer uh, out loud or just when I'm reading um, I think can you speak to its influence of, of reading others' work on your own writing, on your own? Um, your um, own? Yes, I can, because then I see where my failings are. And a lot of times I'll take notes because I see what they did that I didn't do that made their book really spectacular. And then um, I'll think about that for a while. So I'll write it down so I don't forget. And I'll even sometimes write the page number so I can go back and look at it. But I'm constantly reading other people's literatures and science books and you know everything I can find, all the research that I can find to, um, to try to make it better. I just would like to always keep growing in my life in every way, not just writing, but as a person. And we actually have a follow-up question. Um, what are you reading right now that you love? Actually, right now what I'm reading is not so pleasant, but um, I'm reading a novel on the side. I'm reading Diane Wilson's Dakota stories. And they're interviews with elders primarily, and I like them. They're people just talking. But the other thing I'm reading is about the history of institutionalizing Indian people during the first uh, of the, the 1900s, early 1900s. And that's not just uh, mental hospitals and state hospitals and St. Elizabeth's but um, one very abusive mental hospital and a very abusive uh, boarding school system. Well, um, those are the questions that I have, so. That wasn't a good question to end with. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh... To hear abuse at the end. <laughs> <laughs> mental hospitals. Um, well, I'll, I can I can um, sort of uh, could, I'll ask a question, right? Um, these the observations you make of the lives of animals they're so so intimate, and um, I'm just I'm just a, 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 and this might be a, a very strange question to ask, but but. Um, how, you know, how, how do you approach a living creature? Not in terms of how to write about it or anything like that, but in, in, in your present, in your, in the day, right? When you see, when you see an animal, when you see a living being in front of you, right? Um, well, you mean like my own Mustang and my, my own wild burrow that I've had, I'd had for many years? Sure, yeah. Um, well, they come to me, they know I've got a treat or something and that I'm getting ready to feed them hay and they're happy. They're wonderful. Um, I think like they think I greet them like they would greet one of their own. The horses want me to breathe into the nostrils so that they can smell what I smell, what my breath smells like and um, the burrow wants her butt scratched. <laughs> so what else can I say? You just do it, you know, you do what they need, what they want. And um, if, it's a wild, if it's a wild animal, usually I turn my back unless it's a mountain lion. And then I um, get a very bright light and shine them away. And also I don't want them to get into town because they'll get shot for sure. 
So I just use bright lights. They're usually only out at night. And I do that to send them away. Although I did have, I do have a friend that raised, she gave up her own life as a human and lived in the wild with two baby mountain lions and raised them as a mother mountain lion would as much as she could. They were orphaned. And um, so for two years, she took care of them until they knew enough that they were adolescents and they needed to separate from her and that she was another species and they began their separation. However, they still loved her so much that when they saw her, they would squeal and then purr really loud. It was like they would like to jump in her arms, but by then they were too big. And so she, was, she would just go put her arms around them and they'd be purring. At the time I had a bad knee and I heard that the purr of mountain lions helped bones heal. So I was trying to get my knee next to them. <laughs> so, but I had to have it replaced, so it didn't matter. <laughs> So anyway, I wanted to I wanted to cuddle them too, but I was not their mother. She was really their mother. Well, thank you, thank you for answering my question, and I think that's a a, a beautiful story to end on. Thank you for sharing it. Um, her name is Megan, and and. Uh, She's gotten married, so I can't remember her last name, but it's a good story. Can you imagine giving two years of your life to live in the cold and uh, outside to be with mountain lion babies? It's an incredible love. It is. Well, I would like to thank Julie Glass and Christine Kassan, Angela, Aggie, Catherine, and everyone else who, who helped out to get this uh, set up for tonight. Um, but more than anything, I would like to thank you, Linda. Um, Chimikwich, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you so much, And um, I really invite everyone to unmute once again and uh, show their appreciation and give a round of applause to Linda. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Linda. Thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs>